<laughs> it's not going to be fun. You calm yourself down. I'm a little resentful about the way that they enjoy church. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. I'm going to bring like a big box of Milky Ways and Snickers candy bars. And while they're leaving, I'm handing them out to you guys yeah. one of these weeks. I want you all to go, yay! <laughs> the the service. Hey, those kids, man. I, I was uh, with somebody last week through a Bible study. I was getting something out of one of the back cabinets, and he saw Mr. Lee's stash back there, all the candy that he has. He's like, they really do have a lot of candy back here. It's, wow! <laughs> these kids, they've got it made in all seriousness. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing that our kids are in church, and it is a church service that they have back there. Yeah, it's, uh, they have uh, hymns they sing, they pre hear preaching, and they, uh, the things that they do are on a, on a level for children. You may have noticed that our kids, some of them don't know how to act in church. And if you look around, you may notice that oftentimes adults don't know how to act in church. And they, that's why you got to go and learn. And so be patient and gracious. When uh, it just seemed like they were wound up this morning, and it was even during prayer and so forth, a little bit of a distraction. But they're growing and they're learning. Last week, actually, their their behavior was absolutely incredible. But that's what we want to invest ourselves in. And so you just you just be be an adult about it when they're a little distracting. And sometimes an adult needs to step up and say, "Hey, let me share your hymn book with you." And uh, maybe calm somebody down just by standing beside them or whatever. You'd be amazed at how, uh, how much an adult standing next to a kid uh, will calm them down, unless it's me. Uh, <laughs> sometimes how much it'll wind them up. But uh, anyway, uh, you're in, are you in John chapter 4? John chapter 4. I don't know how many of you are as excited about this series that we're beginning today as I am, but uh, I'm really looking forward to what God's going to do in the next several weeks as we really look at worship uh, in the Word of God. And really, I, I think it's going to help our church a lot. I'm really anticipating our church being greatly helped by, our, by ourselves really getting uh, a grasp of biblical worship and then practicing and incorporating it and even when we come together for our corporate worship. And so... Uh, let's go ahead and read our text this morning. If you'll look down to verse 19 of John chapter 4. And uh, we'll introduce our text in a little bit, but let's just read this uh, beginning in verse 19 right now. And we'll read down to verse 26. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. The woman saith unto Him, I know that Messiah is cometh, which is called Christ. When He's come, He'll tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am He. Now we'll pray and we'll ask the Lord to help us this morning. God, this morning, it really is true that without You we can do nothing. It would be a travesty if because of eloquence or because of a brilliant construction, uh, the sermon this morning were to impress us. What we need, God, is truth and Your Spirit to make a real impression on us. And I pray that as we just take a simple look at defining worship this morning, that You would impress us. Help us to see You in heaven as holy, high, and lifted up. Help us to see the cross as the means for us to be reconciled to a God that we would be separated from because of holiness and because of sin. And then help us to see how natural it ought to be for us to bow down and worship You. I pray that this morning that this part of the service, Lord, 
would be presentable to you as worship as well. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm greatly burdened about the matter of worship. Uh, I believe that, of course, that the Word that belongs as a definition for our service. Matter of fact, I, I people will call me sometimes and they'll say, when is your worship service? And they're speaking of our Sunday a.m. service. When's your worship service? And, uh, you know, it is. It's our 11 a.m. service. It's when we've come and really want to worship at 11 a.m. But I see our Sunday evening service the same way. We, we come to worship Lord Jesus. And I see our midweek service the same way. It's a worship service. Most believers don't know what worship means. That's not meant to denigrate or insult anyone, but the reality of it is, is that worship is very, very simply defined and understood, and in its basic definition, most believers don't know what worship is. Let me illustrate it to you this way. Oftentimes, uh, someone will call it, maybe they're trying to make a sales, or they're wanting to send somebody uh, to uh, perform at the church uh, for a music type of thing, and I did say perform. I think that oftentimes it's performance. And again, I don't know the hearts of any person, but I know the way we receive it sometimes. And so they want to, you know, have an, a, a, a Christian entertainer. And, it, and I'm not saying that in a, in a bad term. It's saying a Christian who's an entertainer. They, they provide entertainment. I don't know how many of you are entertained by genres of Christian music, but I am. Oftentimes, I'm entertained by Christians who, like, you know, are Christian about their entertainment. I think that's a fine thing. Uh, but they'll say something to me like this. Can I please speak with your worship leader. And I speak with your worship leader. I say, well, I am. I'm the worship leader in our church. And uh, they say, well, uh, so uh, what, what type of, uh, of worship are you involved in? I say, well, you know, all aspects of it, actually. Uh, pretty much all of it. <clears throat> uh, well, what instrument do you play? Uh, yes. Well, I don't want to claim anything. <laughs> Excuse me about that. I have my voice a little husky. I'm thankful I have a voice this morning. I didn't have it most of this week. Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> while I sing, and <laughs> you can call it playing the piano, uh, what I do to the piano. Uh, you, <laughs> you could uh, call it. But the fact of the matter is, is that as pastor, I'm really responsible for the tone of our church service, the way that uh, things are led. And, uh, you know, I answer to God for that. That's, I think, an area where a pastor has the oversight. When the Bible talks about a pastor taking the oversight in a in a church, I think one of the areas that he takes oversight is worship. Answer to God, answerable to God for everything, uh, for your finances, for your uh, for uh, doing ministry, for your outreach. For but one of the things you have oversight over is, of course, the worship service. I don't think there's anything more important that a church does corporately than worship. I don't think there's anything more important that we do. Uh, than, than worship the Lord Jesus. That really ought to be the defining aspect of our coming together and uh, presenting ourselves before the Lord. Nothing more important than worship. But usually when people call me and they ask about worship, they're talking about music. They're asking about, uh, <clears throat> about who is our uh, musician and who leads the service with, with music. And again, anything I'm saying this morning isn't being negative about uh, any other church or anyone else, it's just about us and about the Word of God and being under the authority of the Scripture. Uh, you know, what is done in the name of worship or what we call the worship leader usually isn't. Uh, I have some dear friends that probably wouldn't be quite where we're at with the kind of music that they would play or accept as worship and so forth, but uh, they've been recently bothered in their churches uh, by the performance aspect. You wouldn't know who this is. You wouldn't know what I'm talking about, so I could mention it. I remember a, a man just about two years ago calling me. He said, I, I'm just really bothered by our worship in our church because of two things that he mentioned that really bothered him about their worship. And I think he had, I guess he was, Lord, the Holy Spirit was really dealing with him about, about the way that he worshiped. He said, first of all, he said, I feel, a, I feel as though the congregation isn't involved in the worship. So I feel like the congregation isn't together. There's no corporate worship. He didn't say corporate, but he said, I felt like, uh, he said, our musicians are so talented that every single week they write new songs. And so when they sing the songs, 
even if they have us join on a course and so forth. He says, we don't know them. We don't know the songs. And so uh, he said, we, we can't really participate. We're, we're trying to catch on instead of just worship. So he said, we, we, just, we don't know the songs. And uh, so it, it's tough for us that way. But he said, he said, our musicians are so good. He said that it's really is, it's become a performance. He said, our, we have, our lead guitarist is so skilled, he's so talented. He says, you know, he's, he's skilled enough, he can, of course, make a living at it. He has made a living at it. But he said, every, every time that there's a service, he says, there's a one minute, a two minute guitar riff where he just goes off and does a, you know, a, there's a, no singing or whatever, but it's a performance. I mean, he's showing his skills for that minute or so or, uh, sometimes more than that. He says every single time there's a song, there's that time when you really have that guitar solo. And he said every time you're like, wow, <laughs> that man can play the guitar. He's incredible at it. He said, but you don't think, wow, Jesus, about anything about it. In other words, you're impressed. He said, music's really, really good. He said, but you're impressed with people, but you're not impressed with Jesus. And those were two major concerns that he had uh, that he really brought before his church and said, you know, I'm concerned. And... Uh, Again, don't take this the wrong way. Let me just say some things to help you uh, with perspective for just a minute. There's nothing... It isn't a brag to be terrible at something. I know churches that are like prideful about being having pathetic music. I'm talking about like, you know, well, you know, we're just not like, it's not a performance for us. So, so basically we come together and just do a horrible job of our singing, it's not thought out, it's not prepared, it's not deliberate. Uh, it's, it is an afterthought, but bless God, it's not, it doesn't give us the glory. You know, <laughs> there's nothing uh, to glory in. I think if I always tell this, but it's just always funny to me when I think about it. I think of my pastor that I served under when I first was in the ministry full time, uh, Dr. McClure, and he used to, a lot of times, he'd be sitting on the platform, and he'd sit in a, in a chair on the platform, and he'd have his eyes closed. Sometimes he'd get up after the special and he'd say, you know, sometimes, I, I always cracked me up that he said it and the people that were doing it never, never bothered them. But he'd get up and he'd say, you know, sometimes you may notice that during the special music, he says, I sit with my eyes closed and some people think I'm praying or I'm meditating. He says, actually, I'm enduring. <laughs> <laughs> and it was scheduled, you know. It's, in other words, our order of service was, you know, you open in that church, we open with the doxology every service. And it's the only church I've ever been to that did that. We open with the doxology. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, you creatures here below. Praise Him above, you heavenly hosts. Praise uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That, I think that's fine. I, I think it became a little bit ritualistic after a while. But uh, anyway, so we do that. <clears throat> and then we would have opening prayer. And then we'd have our first song. And then we'd usually uh, have announcements. And then we'd have special music. and the, Or a choir number. And then we would, uh, and I don't remember if it was exactly this order, uh, but then we would sing a couple of congregational songs, and then we'd have a special, or we'd have a last song and then a special, and then the pastor would sing, and the special oftentimes wasn't very special. And I remember thinking, it'd just be better to leave that out. It would just be better. You know, I, you'd hear this sometimes. I hate this. I don't, I, personally, on a personal level, this bothers me. Pray for me. I just found out I was going to sing. <laughs> you know, which means two things being interpreted first of all it means I really haven't put any thought or preparation into worshiping at this time and leading this part of the worship that's what it means to me first of all mm -hmm. secondly it means uh, if I do a lousy job I'm not to blame but if I do a fantastic job then I'm really skilled really talented you know and I, you know people will say well open your mouth and God will fill me all these things that people say. But the reality being interpreted, if I came unprepared, if you do that in this church, let me just warn you, if you get up and you say, pray for me, I just found out I was going to sing, I'll say, just go ahead and sit down. Don't sing. Don't bother. I'm serious. You say, well, Pastor, could God ever lead somebody just to stand up and sing? He's allowed to do that. God has permission to do anything He wants to in our church, in our service. But God doesn't do things that way. God does things decently and in order. And uh, things are either done orderly uh, or they're very, very evidently done by God. So if somebody gets up and the Lord's led them and, and it really there hasn't been a lot of thought or preparation, yet the Spirit of God comes on them. And I believe that can happen. And God just says, you know, I want you to speak this, say this, or I want you to sing this. 
and that happens, it will evidently be God that did it, and no one will need to comment on it. I have a hard time sometimes not getting up after singing a hymn and commenting on the hymn or preaching a hymn. You know, our opener always affects my prayer. When I open in prayer, our opening song just always affects my thinking because of the words that are in it. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it really leads in how our flow of our service goes because of the words and because of we sing with our heart to the Lord that it does influence and affect us that way. Okay, so the re I'm saying that. I'm not, again, I'm not denigrating. I'm not attacking. I'm not picking on anybody or anything. Uh, but we as believers ought to be very, very deliberate when it comes to worshiping God. Shouldn't we? In other words, we ought to know what's happening. And uh, we ought to know if worship is an offering to God, we ought to know what we're offering God. And we ought to be unified in it, oughtn't we? As, as, as believers. And so we do in our church, on purpose, deliberately, uh, emphasize corporate worship. That is all of us singing together. We need to have better uh, special music where a, a group or an individual uh, really represents us and uh, sings to the Lord and represents all of us in that. We need to work harder on that and, and uh, put more concerted effort into that as a church. Uh, but we need to be involved corporately. That's why, you know, you could, you could scratch a squire, choir, a squire. It sound, kind of sounds like, yeah, scratch a squire. It sounds like a chalkboard or something type of music. Anyway, you want to y'all get proficient playing the chalkboard, maybe we'll let you. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, you could scratch a choir number or a, so, a solo or a duet or a quartet or whatever, and we'd be all right if all of us together come and sing from our hearts. I always encourage people, This is I found this to be really true, a congregation that sings in unity and just pours it out to the Lord, everybody, always sounds good. You can't, you can't have a terrible voice and sing in the choir and have it sound good. You'll stand out like a sore thumb in a choir. If you can't hold a tune in a bucket and you sing in the choir and you sing out, I'll hear you and I'll wish you weren't in the choir. Uh, <laughs> but you can do it in the congregation and it'll sound good. I'm serious about this. <clears throat> it's amazing uh, how that a congregation of people that are just singing to the Lord sound good. I could give you personal illustrations of people very close to me that used to be embarrassed because they couldn't sing. They felt like they were tone deaf or whatever. But they really got convicted about worshiping God and about how it wasn't about them, it was about the Lord. And how they really started singing in the congregational service. And man, it made a difference. It was notable. Now I've been in church services where the music was deliberate and it was uh, high quality as far as the investment that was made into it, the training and the effort that was put forth. And I've observed that it, didn't, it, it really didn't minister. It, did, it, it wasn't good. The, the, the service wasn't good. For instance, I was in a large church in Tallahassee one time just passing through and stopped and visited there. And I, I remarked about, in my mind, I thought about how much effort the musicians put into the singing part of the service. And uh, I noticed that like four people by the front row were really into that. And then everybody else was standing with their hands in their pockets waiting for the song to get over because they had to stand for the song. It was, a, you know, the, the uh, congregational singing, the congregational songs. And I, I thought, man, as well as, uh, as good a job as they're doing, this really isn't worship. This isn't congregational worship because there's four people up there that are involved, uh, but everybody else is just here. I've been in churches where the old hymns are sung, like we sing in our church, and I've observed that the song leader is singing, and he's the only one you can hear. Everybody else is kind of looking down at their hymn books like they never heard the song before and just muttering. You know, just, mm, they won't open their... I've seen people chewing gum while they're singing. You know, it's, it's hard... <laughs> Don't try it. So try it. Try it outside of church sometime. But I've watched. I looked around. I've seen like four people chewing gum. Yeah. You know the gum chewers, the masticators, and they're just chowing down on gum. And I'll be honest with you, it isn't the style of music that excludes it from being quality worship. It's the involvement of the congregation that that excludes it from being worship. 
And so I'm all for congregational worship. Now, I'm, I'm partial. I, I, I have convictions about style of music, that sort of thing. I'm not, I, I'm not, that's not where we're going at this time. But what I'm going to say to you this morning is that if that's how you define worship, I don't think you and I understand it very well. I want to just give you a couple of simple definitions, and I want to look at, at something that Jesus really taught uh, this woman at the well about worship. First of all, in the Old Testament of the Scripture, and by the way, there are literally hundreds of references uh, to worship in the Old Testament, but in every instance, most of them come from the word shakah, which literally means bow down. Literally means bow down. Um, I'm a little bothered by how ostentatious worship performances can be with regard to individuals. Uh, right now it's really popular, and maybe it's not, I, I have a hard time staying with the trends, but uh, it's, it's popular to do the, um, what do they call that? It's not exactly dancing, but it's the, illust you know, when people are, during the, during the song, they're actually acting out or doing like a pantomime or whatever. Everybody's giving me blank stares. Have you never seen this before? You know, or you know, it's usually the teenagers, and it's kind of a dance that they do with the worship, and they're basically acting out the song. Oh, oh. like the interpretive dance. That's is that what it is? You're talking about like the interpretive. Mm -hmm. But it, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's it's cool, isn't it? Isn't it what people do? Right? Yeah. Okay. Anyway. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking about that. I'm about 42 pounds, 40 pounds too heavy right now to do any interpretive dancing for you folks. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Something will pop on me. And, on a, uh, anyway, we don't need that. Okay, just trust me. All right. Is that funny? All right. Uh, <laughs> now I've lost my focus. This is terrible. Um, Man. You said that that was really popular. That's I realized, yeah, I know what I was saying. Oh, okay. I had a purpose in, in saying it. I said it on purpose. And now I forget what the purpose was. Let's move forward. We'll just we'll just segue right into something that has better purpose than, than that. Okay. So, uh, but the, the, that type of style uh, is, is often done now. There's a lot of, it's always something new, something different, isn't it? That's done as far as the leading in worship, and I think some of it can be good. Some of it, I think, is a little bit, a little bit overkill. I know where I was going with it. None of that has anything to do with bowing down. Or mm -hmm. sometimes in the end, you know, that that last gesture they do, you know, they do like a ballet, you know, kind of a bow down, kind of a sort of a act or sort of a thing. But I'm offended sometimes at how people are open instead of closed in worship. Now, I believe in holy hands. Like when Paul told Timothy, he said, I would that men of God should pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. It means empty. That means there's nothing hidden. You know, it's when you, you know, you're kind of like, hey, how you doing? You got something, you, you know, you, your hand's closed because you're holding something that doesn't belong, isn't holy. And it's, it's in your life. And so, uh, for instance, if you came here this morning and you came for whatever reason it is uh, that where your human motives, obviously God has a greater motive. You're in the right place. Uh, even with the, wrong, for, with the wrong motive, God can work in your heart. You put yourself in the place where God can work. But you came to the worship service, you thought, man, I hope Pastor didn't talk about this this morning. I hope the Scripture's not because I've got this in my life and I'm holding on to it. It's, you're not empty. You're not coming to the Lord with empty hands. I understand the, the idea of emptiness. But my friend, bowing down is literally flat on your face. It's not on your tiptoes. You know, you watch people with instruments, man, I'm telling you, they're getting up. They're not getting down. And by getting down, I don't mean it in that sense of the word. But I mean, they're, they're, they're becoming very... Um, not less of me, but more of me. They're, they're very opening out instead of closing in to where, God, I'm small, I'm meaningless, I'm, you're holy, you're magnificent, and I am a worm. And literally, when you understand worship, bowing before God happens. In every instance where you see individuals bowing down before God, it happens, first of all, because of perspective of holiness. 
that helps an individual to see that God is high and lifted up like we've been seeing it with, with Isaiah. God's high and lifted up. And I'm unclean. And I dwell in the midst of a generation of uncleanness. In other words, I'm identified with uncleanness and God is identified with sanctification and holiness. And so my worship really says, God, you're here and I'm here. Worship says, God, you're high and lifted up and I'm, I'm, I'm here. There's a lowliness to worship. A.W. Tozer said something like this. This is a loose paraphrase. But he spent his life really trying to understand worship. And he said about worship, he said, you know, he said, you can worship something, or he said, you can admire something and not worship it. He said, but you cannot worship something without admiring it. In other words, when you look at God, it isn't one of these... Let me give you a for instance. It's not as popular anymore, and I'm not stepping on toes to trying to offend anybody, but I don't like the song I Can Only Imagine. You guys know what I'm talking about? The song I Can Only Imagine. It's probably your favorite. It's your favorite. I make something mad every time I say this. Uh, I don't like it for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Bible says, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath entered in the heart of man the things which God hath promised to them that love Him. So, it should be, I can't even imagine. Not, I can only imagine. In other words, you have no idea how glorious heaven is and how glorious it is to be in God's presence because there's nothing on this earth that you could relate to that would help you to relate to that. So it ought to be titled, I, can, I, can, I can't even imagine. And instead of having all the ways that you think that you're going to relate to God, say, I have no idea how I'm going to relate to God in His holiness because that's what the Bible says. It's, more, it's just it's scripturally inaccurate. It always grates me when I hear a song or a... Uh, read a concept, and I really, and I just think instantly of a scripture that contradicts it. I just think, it so it bothers me for that reason. I'm very sorry. Didn't mean to ruin your song, um, but that's that's what it does to me. But to the the worst of it is like when it talks about, will I stand in your presence? What will my heart say? Or will I dance with you, Jesus? Or will I sing it all? And I just think when I see Jesus, I'm gonna be on my face. I'm not gonna jump up and try to, you know. Anyway, I don't. You understand what I'm saying? In other words. Uh, the veil of Christ's flesh has done away with the separation between us and God, but the holy place is a holy place. There will not be a cavalier flippancy and a lightness when we come into the place where the blood is, is on the altar <coughs> and where the nail-scarred hands and the, uh, the wounded side are a witness, a testimony of the seriousness of God's love for us. It'll be a sobering moment. And I'm telling you, it won't be just the first time. It'll be every time we come into the holy presence of God, we're going to fall on our faces. We're going to bow because that's what the word worship means. It means I bow. In the New Testament of the Scripture, the word proskuneo, uh, it's a word that you know, we, we get our uh, word prostrate from, like you know, being flat uh, on, on the face and the concept of, of lying down. In other words, it's a kneel down, or fall on a face, laying prostrate on the ground is the word for worship. There isn't a definition for worship in the Scripture which does not carry with it the notion of our literally bowing. There isn't a get up aspect of it. Now I'm for triumph. I understand, you know, the I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me in Christ Jesus. This is what I once was, but because of Christ, this is what I am. But my friend, worship looks at holy God in heaven with admiration and says, wow, God, you. And when you look at God, you don't look at a person. I think probably, <laughs> I, again, I'm just I, I, I'm sharing a little bit, and we're going to look at, at the Scripture uh, the, and what Jesus said here. I think probably real worship makes a concerted effort to remove any distracting element. Real worship 
makes a concerted effort to remove any distracted, and I should say human element. I don't like it in our services people are talking while we're singing or whispering or getting up and moving around. I think there's a degree of necessary evil. Uh, if we have visitors that come in while our service has started, you'll see me during the offering time go greet them or give them a bulletin or chat with them a little bit. Uh, it's a little awkward visiting a place. We have visitors this morning. It's a little awkward coming to a small place and being noticed and, and so forth. I think it's important to, to talk to folks and, and uh, that sort of thing. Uh, I'm bothered a lot of times during the offering uh, where if the offering is a part of our worship, it's commanded to do it on the first day of the week, so it's obviously part of the worship, the Sunday worship. Uh, when it seems as though like everybody's just, okay, the offering started, everybody would check out for a minute while they take up the offering and then let's come back. Because if it's worship, we ought to all be involved with it. And even if the Lord doesn't lead us to give specific in an offering, specifically in an, a particular offering, we ought to have prayed about it. And we ought to be offering ourselves during that time, saying, God, you know, my check comes once a month, and that's how you've led me to give financially. But God, you've got 100% of me right now, and I just want to just take a minute and meditate on that reality that you have all of me. God, if you want more of anything financially, it's all yours. I'm a steward of it. But God, you've got all of me. It's a good way to, to prepare your heart for preaching, to tell God you've got all of me, isn't it? And you ought to offer God something, every offering in the church. You ought to offer God something. And say, God, well, I've told you this before. I've told you that I'm all yours. Right now, specifically, my heart's yours, and you can have me for this service. I'm offering it to you. And we ought to be doing that during the offering time. It ought to just be a time when, you know, if there's something that, you, that the Lord's led you, that, that's a very, very spiritual thing, the, the financial giving, uh, because of what it, it what it uh, represents and even if you know you sent in the mail or you not, not in this service there's something that you're giving the lord if it's worship during that time so our service ought to be i'm always convicted uh, i'm oftentimes convicted by our announcements i they say about announcements are necessary evil i think it's profitable sometimes how churches have announcements at the end of the service and so forth if the lord leads we'll change up how we do it in our church as well. But um, our announcements really should detract. They shouldn't take away. In other words, every aspect of a worship service ought to be worship. And it ought to be deliberate. and It ought to be corporate. We ought to be all involved in it. Today, I just want to define worship. That's all we're trying to do today in our message. I'm going to have, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have a couple of... of uh, Specific messages. We're going to talk about fallacies of worship. We're going to talk about uh, the practical practical worship in the church. What the New Testament says about church worship, because individual worship and corporate worship, we'll cover that, are different. You can worship on your own, but worship in the church is prescribed a certain way that God uh, has a very definite opinion about and a desire. Okay, let's look at our context. And let's take our definition of worship and let's get a, a, a final understanding of it. This is the woman at the well in Samaria. One of the things that we know about Jesus' particular ministry while He was on this earth was that He had come to the last house of Israel. He was the Israel's Messiah. He was all of the things that the Bible prophesied about the Messiah, that individual through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He's everyone's Messiah. But when He sent out His disciples by twos and gave them power to cast out devils, power uh, to heal sicknesses, and power um, uh, to forgive sins on His behalf, He told them, don't go to Samaria. And He said, don't go to the Gentiles, but go to the lost house of Israel. And when you understand and know that, it's actually pretty notable in our context that the Bible says that He must needs pass through Samaria. In other words, Jesus... Look at, look at verse, uh, verse 1 of chapter 4. Uh, not verse 1. Uh, yeah, verse 1. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus Himself baptized not but His disciples, 
He left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And notice verse 4, and he must needs go through Samaria. Now, I'm not a great Bible uh, geography expert, but all you have to do is take a look at a Bible map and see that Samaria is actually not the most direct way. It's not the most direct route for Jesus to take. And just looking at what the Bible says about the villages of Samaria and what the Bible says about Samaritans, it's very, very easy to understand that Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans, including in our text. When Jesus asked the woman at the well to draw water and give him a drink, she had a question. She says, How is it that thou, being a Samaritan, askest a water or a drink of me? Or so thou being a Jew, ask a drink of me. I'm a Samaritan. Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You know it and I know it. What's the deal here? And Jesus told her, if you knew who it was that spoke to you, you'd ask Him. And He'd give you living water. Water uh, that, that'll make it so that you'll never thirst again. And we see something special about this woman. I believe that the reason... Jesus must needs go through Samaria. I believe the Scripture is very evident that it's because of this woman and because of these lost individuals that end up receiving Jesus. Look at verse 16. I'm sorry, verse 15. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. When Jesus told this woman that He could give her living water, she said, give it to me. I want it. Now, she's going to bring up worship here in just a minute. She's going to bring up correct worship. But one of the things we see about this woman is that she wanted Jesus. In other words, if there was something that God was offering, she wanted it. And that's pretty key. That's pretty important, isn't it? Uh, there are believers, I believe, who are born again that don't want much, anything God's offering them. Just don't want. You say, Pastor, how can you be a believer and be that way? Well, we're pretty capable of some pretty terrible things. That's yeah. how. There are lost people that don't want anything to do with God. And this woman who had five husbands and was living with a man who wasn't her husband wanted Jesus. She wanted what he had to offer. And so now, she had a hang-up. Before she could respond to what Jesus is offering, she had a hang-up. She knew that the Jews said that the, there was going to be a Messiah, and she believed that. And Jesus said, I'm He. And after Jesus told her that He was the Messiah, she wanted to clarify some things, and what she wanted to clarify was actually about worship. It's interesting. In verse 19, she said, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <clears throat> Our fathers, what's the next word? Worship. What? Worship. Worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Now she's making a stereotype. She's saying you're Jewish. And uh, we're Samaritan. We're all partly Jewish. And she said, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you're saying we've got to worship at Jerusalem. And she's before Jesus can forgive her sins and save her, she wants to hash out this whole worship thing. See, we think that it's just as good to worship in a mountain as it is to worship at Jerusalem. That's her argument. We'd make the same argument, wouldn't we? You're trying to invite somebody to church and they say, well, you know what? I worship God on my own. It's interesting the word church defined ek out of kaleo, the called together ones, uh, the ones who are called together. So churching doesn't happen individually, it happens corporately. And so it's amazing how people, well, I just, I, you know, I do church on my own. The, church, the very definition of the word church excludes that. Church is believers coming together to worship. And so it's a deliberate, on purpose, corporate thing, not an individual thing. I worship on my boat. I worship with my family. I worship this way. And they've just made their own definition for what worship is. I can give you some, uh, some latitude when it comes to worship. I, I haven't always only worshipped with the body. I hope you worship individually, do you? 
hope you have worship time, individual worship, but church is different than that. Mm -hmm. And she's talking about commanded worship, not, you know, freedom. Matter of fact, it seems as though there isn't a lot of latitude when it comes to what God says worship is. She said, we worship in the mountain. Now, why would the Samaritans want to worship in the mountain? I'll give you a couple of reasons. Why did the Jews come up with high places? Remember, who established the high places in Israel? Mm, no. Who's the guy that really started high places and what was the motive behind it? Manasseh. Who? Manasseh. Manasseh. Remember Jeroboam? Yes. Remember Jeroboam? Why did he do it? Why did he establish high places? He made the children of Israel Okay, he did. Why? He didn't want the, 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 the ten, ten tribes. tribes to go and worship in Jerusalem. He was afraid he would lose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he made. split Israel, ten tribes and two tribes. Ten tribes of, Is, of Israel, Ephraim, and two tribes of Judah. And he said, you know what? If they go to Jerusalem to worship, it's a good chance they'll get united back with those two tribes that we split off from, and they won't follow me, they'll follow Rehoboam at, uh, instead of me. And so he established high places as alternate places of worship so that the people could worship God, they'd have an alternative for worship. And so mount, mountains are high places. And, uh, there's good pla high places and bad high places in the Scripture, but Jeroboam established the high places in Israel, particularly for the reason of competing with exclusive Jerusalem worship. And it appealed to the people because it was convenient. The convenience of it appealed to the people. In other words, if you're supposed to appear before God at least three times a year and make the journey to Jerusalem, if you live in Jerusalem, it's not such a great deal. But if you live a long ways away, it's costly in time, resources, and even danger to go to Jerusalem. It's just it's costly to worship that way, and it was tough, and so it's a lot easier. Oh, we've got a local, we've got a local high place we can go to instead of Jerusalem and worship God, and that made a lot of sense, didn't it? Except that God never intended for worship to be predetermined by convenience. In other words, worship. The purpose of worship isn't for it to be convenience. Listen to me. Listen to me here today. I know we're a little over on time. Uh, a lot over on time, whatever. Listen, just give me a second, will you? I used to struggle. I used to struggle with the whole resting in worship and working in worship until I really, <laughs> really got it established in the Scripture the difference between the Sabbath and the first day of the week. See, the Sabbath is a day of rest, and Israel did worship God. But you know, I found, particularly being a pastor, but also really my whole life, I found that worship requires a lot of work. Now y'all are here, and some of y'all came at 10 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock. Nobody came at 11.30. Uh, uh, you came at different times. But you know, some of us were here a long time before that this morning. Matter of fact, a lot of us were here yesterday. Getting ready to worship today, and it's a lot of work. How, how, how much time does it take to get the kids on the bus? We well, got to go out Saturday if they're going to be on the bus Sunday. They, if you don't visit them, they won't come. It takes your Saturday morning, and uh, Sunday morning the bus leaves anywhere from like eight thirty to nine o'clock, so it can be here by Sunday school hour at ten o'clock. And so you got to leave early to get here. Uh, we our bus workers inspect the bus before they leave. They check the tire pressure, they check the fluids, and they clean it. They just make sure it's ready to go. Make sure you know you get surprises when you're not ready. For things, so they show up in time for surprises. So they're here. And actually, most people who work the bus are going to go to Miami Beach to church with us this afternoon. They're going to come back tonight, and they'll probably work on special music, and they'll probably, uh, you know, they'll be a part of the six o'clock service. It's a long day. It's a hard day. It's, it's a work. To put it quite frankly, worship is work. As pastor of our church, I was telling you, Sunday's a long day. My Sunday morning starts six fifteen. It's when I start. Now, sometimes I get up earlier than that, but I start preparing for today at 6.15 this morning. There's just things that I do. You'd be amazed at how wrong things go if you aren't ready for them. You just show up and just let things happen. They don't. It's work. A long time ago, I realized that worship is actually work. It actually requires effort. 
In other words, when the children of Israel were supposed to go to Jerusalem and make that long journey, it was work. It was costly. And when they did it, it was meaningful because of what they'd invested in. It wasn't for them, it was for God. It was done on purpose when they came to the temple to worship. The further you came, really, the more you worshipped. If that makes sense. Today, we want worship to be convenient. You have a Friday night service, so we don't have to get up early on Sunday. I'm planning this weekend, I want to go to the lake, and I, and I actually like to make a trip. So if you could have a few extra services so that worship doesn't interfere with my, you know, my pleasure plans, that would be convenient for me. I'm not picking here. I'm not, I'm not giving anybody a hard time. I understand busy, scheduled lives and all those things. But you know, worship ought to disrupt us just a little bit. In other words, if worship is a disruption, that ought to be a problem. Should it? Should worship disrupting our lives be a problem? Pastor, we're going to be late to the restaurant. Why are you going on and on and on? This is a worship service. If we've given it to the Lord, we've given the Lord our day, we're not really bothered by it disrupting us. If you're a diabetic, grab your needle and you know do what you got to do. Let's keep rolling. I interject humor and so forth, but friend, I want us to understand that worship is effort. It's work. And bowing down before God isn't about me, it's about God. It doesn't lift me up. It doesn't, it doesn't impress people with me and impresses people with God. If you came in a room and everybody's on their face like they're afraid, you'd look around and say, what's everybody afraid of? Isn't it so? You ever see somebody playing the old stare up at a tree joke, you know, you come by and somebody's looking at a tree, next thing a couple more people come, what are you looking at? What's going on up there? Everybody's looking up and pretty soon you got a whole crowd of people looking, they don't even know what it is. But they're looking because everybody else is. You know, real worship ought to do that. Real worship ought to be us bowing down. People say, what are you afraid of? What are you bowing before? Who is it that's worthy of that? When you bow down, people ought to be looking at God. What's, what's going on? That's what we worship ought to be. It might be a little awkward, but I think sometime we'll practice it in our, in our service. We'll, 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 we'll all bow down. Before we, When we start our service, you say, Pastor, when's this going to be? I'm going to make sure to put it on my calendar so I miss it. <laughs> it might, might help us to kneel. I'm not for rituals. This stuff and you know kneelers and all that nonsense. But you know it might be good for all of us just to bow before God. Maybe somebody walked in and they saw us bowing and said, "What's going on here?" Oh, God's holy. We're bowing before Him. Worship. We're worshiping. I understand that you can do things from your heart. That you can do things physically that aren't from the heart and are no good. And you can do things from the heart. Maybe the physical isn't there, but it is good. It's pleasing to God. Understand that. But you know, there might be something about bowing. There might be something about bowing that we need. Because of what's in us. Jesus corrected the woman about worship. She had to get right about worship before she could know who He was. Woman, it's verse 21, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Now we're all in on that, aren't we? You can worship God anywhere. And isn't it true today we can go right to the Holy Throne of God? Amen. Full access through the blood of Jesus Christ, the veil of His flesh, broken so that we could go right to God. Beautiful. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Look at verse 22. You worship, you know not what. We know that we, what we worship for salvation is of the Jews. In other words, Jesus said, Woman, this is word gune. It's not a disrespectful term. It's a, it's a term of address, you know, like lady, like we would use the word lady in a, in a respectful way. And He deliberately tells her, you don't know what you're worshiping in the mountain because God isn't there. God said worship at Jerusalem in the temple. 
And that's where God is. You're going to worship Him. I'm going to worship God in the mountain when God said worship me in the temple. My friend, that's a different God. He's different if He's on the mountaintop when God said He was in Jerusalem dwelling in the temple. That's a different God. Isn't it so? God said, I'm here. Worship me here. And you worship somewhere else. It's a different God. We cannot redefine worship of God. Say, well, this is how I worship God. God said they that worship God must worship Him in spirit. So I'm worshiping in spirit. She said, you don't know what spirit it is. So you don't know what spirit it is. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. Now he said the hour is coming when it won't be here or there. And friend, that's the today. That's the day. Listen, we don't have to go to Jerusalem. Worship is in the church. So we do have to go to the church for corporate worship. Truth is what God's looking for in worship. Listen to me. That's all I want to say. Worship is bowing down. And worship is worshiping God in truth. You can't just define truth. You can't be like Pilate and say, what is truth? You can't just say, this is true to me. Truth is not relative. Truth finds its source and emanates forth out of God Himself. And therefore, my friend, worship comes from understanding God's Word. So there's true worship and the alternative, which is anything but what God says. And that's worship defined today. This morning I don't feel led to have a long invitation. I do want to be specific this morning and help us to understand the importance of worship. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, my friend, the only way to get to God is through Jesus. That's the only way for true worship. It's Jesus Christ. He's the cornerstone of true worship. He's the source of living water. If you don't know Jesus as your Savior, don't leave this place. Don't leave this place without having that settled. Don't be embarrassed about something that could have the vital importance of literally your eternal destination. Get it settled this morning. I'll be available after the service. You say, Pastor, I'm not sure I understand the Gospel, how to receive Jesus as my Savior. It's very, very simple. Jesus is God. He's God's Son. He's holy just like God because He is God. And He died for sin, came to the earth, born of a virgin, miraculous birth, and He died for sin, though He had never sinned. Because He died for your sin and my sin. And God has offered salvation universally. Any person who wants to know Jesus as their Savior, anyone who wants to worship God can. But you can only do it God's way, and that's by receiving Him. And it's really simple. It's just like receiving a gift. You just have to accept it. When I was a child, and the Bible says that if we come to God, we'd have to come like a child. When I was a child, I understood it well enough to have that experience. And I just understood I was a sinner, and I told God so. I said, God, I'm a sinner. I understood that Jesus died for my sins. I said, I know Jesus died for my sins. Not these exact words, but this is really what I prayed to God. I want to be saved because of what Jesus did. God, I want salvation, the free gift. God, save me just for asking. He'll save you too just for asking this morning. Get that settled. But you're a believer. And it might be, it might be you've been a little cavalier, a little reckless, a little careless about worship. I, Christians get emotional and argue and mad at each other. I don't tell you, people get wound up about worship and they never open a Bible. They're mad about something because they, they're attached to it emotionally, but they never even open a Bible to find out if they're right. And it might be that's the way worship is for you. You know, whenever we say we're going to have a series on worship, there are a lot of predispositions when we come together, preconceptions. You know, a pastor better not talk about this because I disagree with it. I don't even know. Or, you know what, I think that, you know, we better talk about this. this hey, listen, what about just, let's just open ourselves up to what the Word of God says. And let's start that by acknowledging that worship is what it's defined as in Scripture, it's bowing before God. Say, God, 
truth. Spirit and in truth. I'm worshiping you both with my spirit, but God, I'm also wanting to worship you with truth. And that's how we'll start our series. For the next couple of weeks, three more weeks, we're going to be talking about worship in our services. Don't you miss it. Because I'm not going to share all my opinions. I talked a lot about personal opinions here today. But I really want to talk about the Word of God. And we're going to define worship. We're going to continue with our definition of worship. We're going to look at what is truth from the Word of God. And we want to educate ourselves in this area. Because who cares what anyone else is doing? We're going to stand before God someday and we're going to be judged for the things done in our body. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't want worship to be all about me. I want it to be, well, God, this is what I did instead. That will be every bit as valid as the Samaritan saying, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And God says, whoop de doo Didn't mean anything to me. I want my worship to mean something to God. So I'm going to let Him define it. Father, thank You for the good attention that's been given here this morning to this topic. God, we've got a lot to learn. We have a lot of room for growth in the area of worship. And ultimately, it ought to be about You. We want to worship You and have You be pleased by us. So help prepare our hearts for it. Help us to practically begin to study and to learn the things that we've looked at today, this week, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for your good attention this morning. You're dismissed.